Hello, and welcome to the AAMFT Podcast. Your all-access pass to the latest news developments and thought leaders in the world of systemic therapy. We strive to relate, educate, and innovate one episode at a time. I'm your host, Dr. Eli Karam, and we're brought to you by the American Association for Marriage and Family Therapy. Our podcast explores topics that relationship-based therapists care about. In addition to featuring unique conversations and interviews with established experts, our show provides information and education on direct practice and emerging trends in the MFT profession. For more information, please visit us at aamft.org. Thanks for listening and enjoy the show. Eli, back with you on the AAMFT podcast today, continuation in our Pioneer series. Gentlemen, I've been wanting to talk to for a long time, quite the personality, Dr. Frank Dettilio, notable for being able to bridge the gap between individual clinical psychology, which is thought as very linear and pathology-based, and a health and strength-based world of MFT. He's done that through the incorporation of cognitive behavioral therapy applied to working with families and systems. Maybe you've seen Frank talk or you've read about him in books, but you never heard from him quite like this. In our interview today, we'll go back to his humble origins, the child of Italian-American immigrants and what that was like for him and studying under the learning tree of such great behaviorists as Joseph Wolpe, the great Aaron Beck, among others, and to his appreciation for structure and systemic work uh, in his relationships with Sal Mnuchin and Harry Aponte. If you've ever wondered how you can go from a more linear, behavior-based world to a systemic world, this episode's for you. Let me just give you a brief introduction to Frank. He's one of the leading figures in the world of CBT for families, as well as forensic psychology, which we'll touch on briefly today. He received his doctoral training in clinical psych at Temple in Philadelphia, and he trained in behavioral therapy with the the great Edna Foa, Joseph Wolpe, who we mentioned, and he completed a postdoctoral fellowship in cognitive therapy with Aaron Beck in the Department of Psychiatry at UPenn. He's currently a part-time teaching associate with the Department of Psychiatry at Harvard Medical School, where he formerly served as an instructor in psychiatry for 14 years. He's also a clinical assistant professor in psychiatry with the University of Penn Perelman School of Medicine, where he's taught since 1988. He holds licenses in Pennsylvania, New Jersey, New York, and Delaware. He's won many awards for our purposes. He was recognized by the AAMFT in 2013 for his outstanding contribution to marriage and family therapy. He's presented at many AMFT conferences, as well as keynote speakers. He's got over 300 publications, 21 books, including The Therapeutic Relationship and Cognitive Behavioral Therapy, A Clinician's Guide, as well as Case Studies Within Psychotherapy Trials, Integrating Qualitative and Quantitative Methods. I hope you will enjoy listening to this interview as much as I did conducting it. We'll be back after Frank. I am pleased to be joined on the AAMFT podcast by Frank Dettilio, a pioneering force in integrating what is probably the most accepted and commonly practiced theoretical orientation, cognitive behavioral therapy, regardless of what professional affiliation you have, whether you're an MFT, a social worker, a psychologist, a counselor. Frank is a pioneer in our field of integrating family systems with cognitive behavioral therapy. And thank you so much for being here, Frank. If you've listened to the show, the first question is always, right? You got to, we like to know the person behind the model. It's, it's more interesting many times than the model itself. So how did you first my friend, decide to become a systemic therapist? Well, that's a, that's a great question, and I agree with you. I think that uh, it's the person who makes the degree and the approach, and it's every about everything about integrating, you know, who they are. And, you know, life experiences have shaped all of us in one way or the other, and my, is, uh, my situation is no exception. So I, uh, I decided to become a systemic therapist because when I was 
uh, studying in my doctoral program, even before that, and I was exposed to uh, the systemic therapies, I found them very attractive uh, in many ways. Uh, but at the same time, I was studying to be a cognitive behavior therapist. Well, actually, as a behavior therapist first, and then later became a cognitive behavior therapist. And uh, this, the two didn't seem to jibe very well. Uh, I liked a lot of the techniques and approaches of the cognitive behavioral pro- approach, but uh, it lacked what the systemic therapies offered, which is that circularity and uh, other dynamics that made it so important when you work with more than one person. So it, it was a, a melding of the two, and uh, it evolved over time. And uh, Give us also, uh, I like to, to locate us in time and place, Frank. So, all right, so those of you not familiar with our work, yeah, where, where are we and what So we're, we're uh, talking about the, we the late 1970s. Uh, uh, very early 80s, I was exposed to uh, the systems of, and structural approach through my training at Temple University. And I was fortunate enough to be in Philadelphia, which was right down the street for from for the Child Guidance Center, which uh, Salvador Mnuchin and Harry Aponte were really coming up in their visibility with the uh, systems approach, the structural approach. So I, w- I was looking for ways to kind of blend it. I, I found that cognitive behavior therapy was too linear when working with couples and families, and I, I, I was intrigued by the systems approach and felt that somewhere it, it provided more fertile ground for that integration of the two modalities. That, that was discouraged, however, because cognitive behavior therapy was viewed as just too linear by a lot of the people in marriage and family therapy. And it's interesting because later in my career, fast forward 20 years, uh, decided to uh, try to do some kind of research that would show that they could be integrated. I couldn't come up with a an empirical study, but I decided, being a champion of case-based research, I decided to do a, a case book, which was eventually called uh, uh, Case Studies in Couples and Family Therapy, Systemic and Cognitive Perspectives. And what I did was I invited uh, a number of the major figureheads uh, at the time in couple and family therapy to present the, their case using their modality. And then with their permission as an editor, I went through it and annotated where I felt that some of the techniques were similar to c- cognitive behavior therapy or whether they could enhance what they did if they blended it. And then I gave the whole thing back to them and I said, you know, you have the last word. Tell me if you think I'm delusional or whether or not this stuff can work. And it was nice dialogue between myself and, and I had wonderful people like uh, Salvador Mnuchin and Insu Kim Berg and, you know, Chloe Madonna's group and uh, the best of the best. And it made for a nice dialogue. And the vast majority of them uh, said, you know, yeah, this is kind of comports with what we do, uh, some more than others. But it was a nice uh, way of saying that uh, very applicable. Yeah, and you said so much there. So not not only were you in the right time and the right place, a hotbed for systemic thinking Philadelphia in the late 70s, early 80s, but you also had this respect for systemic thinking. And you're correct, this critique of behavior therapy being too linear, something, you know, we think of behavior parent training and something parents do to children, uh, and not recursive, not circular, more linear. And then you were also a systemic thinker in the world of linear thinkers, uh, psychologist, which is your background before you picked up this couple and family systemic piece. How did you reconcile those two in, in the world of psychology, which was very different from the way we think of systems? How, how did you present your ideas within a pretty linear framework of clinical psychology? Very carefully, and I kept an open mind with uh, how to begin to blend it. I uh, you know, have a very strong background in behavior therapy. I, I worked with and trained with Joseph Wolpe, the late Joseph Wolpe, and then later with Aaron Beck, and went on to work with him for years. And I uh, did a lot of thinking and reading about many of the folks who uh, constituted uh, the different systems therapy. I, I read some of the early works by uh, such individuals like uh, Von Bertalanffy, who wrote in the 1960s on general systems theory. And I read a lot of Mary uh, Bowen's work and uh, Virginia Satir. And and, and I liked Virginia particularly because she had a quote one time that I I even put in one of my books. She said, it behooves us all to continue being students. My recommendation is that we 
we free ourselves to look anywhere to what seems to fit. And this makes us each of us continually growing entities. And I thought, boy, you know, she, she put her finger on it. So I, I continued to, to read uh, the systems and structural theorists as well as uh, the, the straight behaviorists and try to find, you know, how that fit. It wasn't easy and it took a lot of time. What was it like working with Aaron Beck, who is, I believe, well into his 90s now, isn't he? Yeah, and and yeah. Wolpke, so those are names that everybody's heard of. What was, what was it like uh, sitting under their learning tree? Well, it, it was interesting. Uh, I, I first met Wolpe when I went to a, a lecture that he had at a Jewish community center. He was a brilliant man, but he was he was an, the God's answer for insomnia. I mean, he's just a terrible speaker, and he successfully uh, cleared out the uh, auditorium. We should have had him in Vietnam. We probably would have been out of there five years earlier. He 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 just put everybody to sleep. So I was the I found myself as like the only one left. So I went up and made talked to him, and he invited me to come down and train with him. I, I've never had the luck of the Irish, but. I did have some fortunate situations, and one was meeting him, because uh, not only did I get a chance to work with him, but he had the Ju a June Institute every year, and he brought big-name people to the June Institute, which I attended. And so here I'm in this room with Anna Freud, uh, Victor Frankl, Albert Ellis, and uh, all, all these big names, and I, I didn't realize how fortunate I was until many years later. I thought, my God, you know, I was eating lunch, eating lunch with these people, talking about treatment. So that was really interesting. And then Aaron Beck, who was just coming up the ranks at that time and had just published his book, uh, Cognitive Therapy with Depression, was very interested in com uh, converting straight behaviorists to cognitive therapists, which eventually led to cognitive behavior therapy. So he offered me a fellowship, a postdoctoral fellowship, and then I went over and I, I worked with him. But I kept my foot in the lot of the uh, structural and strategic uh, domains. I, I met Harry Aponte, which was a, a wonderful experience. And we, We've had Harry on the podcast, and he's a, yeah. he's a wonderful guy. He has a he lot sure of great is. stories. Uh, sure so is. when you were doing this, I think you mentioned, you know, liking Virginia Satir and certainly Murray Bowen. Every family therapist has a story, and it's usually tied back to their own family of origin. Another reason I wanted to have you on the podcast is because you're an engaging guy, but you have quite a family background. Tell us uh, how your family of origin influenced both good and bad, your development uh, and your decision to want to be a clinician? Sure. Well, and that's it's an interesting story in and of itself. Uh, so I grew up in, in the late 50s, early 60s, uh, Italian immigrants in New Jersey. It was very, a very highly prejudiced uh, environment in those days. Uh, Ita Italians were bottom of the barrel. And I, I grew up with a lot of prejudice, a lot of abuse. They, they just didn't like us. And I remember as a child, I just, I was so confused by that. And I remember asking my parents, like when I was eight years old, like, is it bad that we're Italian? Italians smack first and ask questions later. So I got whacked up the <laughs> side of the head for asking a stupid question. And and then I said, is that a yes or a no? And I get whacked again. And then it's like, you know, don't ask stupid questions. And they were uneducated, but in their own way, they were kind of explaining, just ignore it. It's, you know, they're malcontents and don't don't let it bother you. So, yeah, the old Italian saying, "Forget about it." You know, just just go on, you move on, thicken your skin. Which, inadvertently, I ended up doing. And in fact, um, I should really send the abusers a fruit basket because they they really helped me develop a lot of resilience. Uh, I'll make sure there's a lot of nuts in the fruit basket uh, because I I learned to build a lot of resilience, and I. And I certainly didn't react to the prejudice by, you know, going and, and pulling down statues and burning and looting buildings. But I tried to use, do it intelligently, intelligently and try to figure out, you know, what's behind this? Why would someone be hated for their nationality? And there was a lot of paradoxes, you know, like, so they would ridicule me and, and beat me up and everything. But they always wanted to come over to my house for lunch because they thought, well, you know, your mother's going to cook lunch. She's, she's Italians are great cooks. Although the, the joke was on them because... For some reason, my mother was a horrible cook. My grandmother was, she could, make, she could make anything taste good. But my mother just did not catch that gene load. 
And she was just a horrible cook, a wonderful person, but a terrible cook. And the harder that she tried, the worse it got. So we used to pray after the meal in my house. Was mom aware of this or were people nice to her? Oh, uh, no, she... we, we were very respectful. You didn't talk to, so we just held our nose and we ate it. And, you know, I wouldn't dare tell her that the, the flies got together and patched up this hole in the screen door. I, I, it just would break her heart. So we ate it. She was not a good cook. So I said, yeah, sure, come on over for lunch. And I, I'll be get esophageal uh, erosion. <laughs> it was there. So when you yeah. have immigrant parents who are kind of living the American dream, it's, it's a world far away from a PhD in academia. And I saw oh, yeah. you obviously achieved and, and maybe even overachieved in your family of origin. How did they think about you carving that pathway and going into the field? Uh, well, that, that was psychology you know, and family therapy. I was the first one in the family to have a college education. And uh, you didn't do that. We were supposed to become stonemasons, which we were bricklayers and stonemasons. And and I did that, you know, to get through college, but I, I wanted more. And, and all of the abuse and, and growing up in that very toxic environment drove me to try to understand what the hell's the matter with these people, you know? Why do they act the way they do? And and I would study their families and see that, you know, they came from crazy, chaotic family lives. And it, it was intriguing to me to uh, try to understand that. So uh, I knew that I wanted to be a psychologist when I was 14 years old. I pursued that and they supported it. I mean, as long as I came up with the money and did it myself, but they always had held out that, you know, you'll, you'll eventually come to your senses and return to, to becoming a bricklayer because that's gives a solid income and so on and so forth. I always like a listener to leave the show with a few new skills or, or tips. Uh, so talk about how you start, how you did that and easiest ways to do that if you're just starting out trying to integrate the two frameworks. Well, first of all, you have to open your mind. And a lot of people have a very closed mind uh, about C CBT because they view it as too academic. And and, and it's interesting because the, the, the same prejudice followed me as I went through my, I mean, I, I stopped being ridiculed by, for being Italian. That stopped when the Godfather movies came out. And the people said, that, you know, these Italians are, they're, 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 they're dangerous. And they'd say, does your father do that kind of stuff? Well, I don't know. You better watch yourself. You could just disappear tomorrow. So they, they left me alone after that. But I, I found a similar kind of prejudice uh, as a cognitive behavior therapist in the, in the marriage and family field because they viewed it as too linear. And it just wasn't sexy enough. Norm Epstein and I did a number of workshops for WMFT, and we, we started polling people because they would take their workshops and say, this is great stuff. And so, well, you know, didn't you learn this in school? And a lot of them said that my professor just told me to skip over that chapter when we had, uh, we came to it because it wasn't family therapy. And in fact, one woman said, she kind of was sheepish about it, and I, I couldn't, I was astounded. She said, my professor told me to literally rip that out of the book because that is not family therapy and it's worthless. And it's funny because by the end of the workshop, she was really uh, uh, impressed with a lot of the approaches. And I saw her in the coffee shop later on down in the uh, conference center. And she said, you know, I find myself really angry with that professor because of his bias. And interesting, Bill Northey did a study in the early 2000s. And he asked uh, members of WMFT, you know, in a word or two, what's the primary treatment or modality? And of the 27 different modalities that were identified, the most frequently identified modality was cognitive behavior family therapy. But they use it blended with other approaches. So I found that a good knowledge of st structural and systems approach was important to understand how to integrate cognitive behavioral strategies and techniques against the backdrop of the systems approach. So uh, I'm basically a systemic family therapy who utilizes a heavy emphasis on changing thoughts and behaviors in a way that goes with the system. So it's not you're treating each individual individually or uh, linear, but you, you, you work that into the system. And we've also been accused of not being focused on emotion, but we are. We do it in a different way. We, we don't uh, address it like the emotionally focused folks like uh, Les Greenberg, uh, where he has a different, you know, he has a more emphasis on the emotional component, but we, we use that in harmony. The, the bigger gear is the changing of thoughts and behavior. So it was a weaving in of uh, taking a look at, you know, for example, when I look at Bowen's transgenerational uh, family therapy, he, one of the things that Mary Bowen never did is focus on the cognitions that people transported down through their families of origin. They, they talked about it 
and they would identify it, but they never really focused on restructuring it. And when I did that case book, Sal Mnuchin did a case, and, and in that case he says, uh, and then I said to the guy, you know, what's going on? And he, he talked about his thoughts, or he talked about his emotions. And Sal Mnuchin says to quote, don't tell me how you feel, tell me what you're thinking. And I thought, Sal, you're doing cognitive therapy. He said, no, I'm not. It's a structural family there. I said, whatever you want to call it. But you're focusing on not only the emotions, but the thoughts that run concurrent with the emotions. And then how does that translate into behavior? So, and interestingly, when Harry Aponte watched one of my live demonstrations one time, he said, you know, you had a lot of good structural moves there. I said, thank you, because I look at them as structural family therapy. That's blended in with that. I often think of like, okay, think of some tenants about how we think of CBT, things like standards, norms, assumptions. I mean, we all have that about how we think about families, how we think of our significant others. Yeah, right. So, well, I I think that the understanding that everybody develops distortions, that's just a a natural part of life. And so identifying them and testing them. One of the things that cognitive behavior therapy adds to a systems approach is that it asks them specifically to weigh the evidence for and against. Uh, And it's not all generated towards, you've got to look at it from a positive standpoint or positive thinking. It's balanced thinking. So what uh, is the evidence that that supports the things that I tell myself about the situation? Uh, If a man says that, you know, his wife uh, continually makes uh, errors in the checkbook, she doesn't give a damn, Uh, you know, this is just her carelessness and she doesn't uh, put any weight on it to really explore that and, and how much of it is interjected by your bias or a bias interpretation or uh, give it some fair balance and then talk about follow through and, and discussing it with each other. So I do it in more of a relaxed way so that it doesn't look like a very academic structured like, you know, you follow this and do that. Uh, we get a lot of criticism like with her homework. We, we put a lot of weight on homework assignments galvanizing what's been learned in treatment. But we don't say, all right, here's your homework assignment and write it down. But we we may say, like, what would you think about if you tried an experiment? Work with them. What would you like to do to see if if you test out your theory about your wife or your husband? And we kind of do it in a collaborative way. Well, we call that in collaborative empiricism. You know, the, the systems approach calls that joining the family or blending it with the family. So we may do it by virtue of kind of a suggestion and then see if they follow through and then see, well, what did you learn about that? It's less academic and and structured, but it's not rigid. Yeah, it's not rigid. And and some people like psychoeducation component of learning. Oh, this is, there's these eight, 10 types of distortions and this is what I do and I'm seeing it. And, and some beginning therapists really like it because of the manualized version. But I always say in, in training therapists and training MFTs, there's a way to be both structured and flexible. It's this both and approach. I call it being flexibly structured. You know, you can just, and, and, and that's, and, and that's a lot of students kind of, I see them sit back in their chair and take a breath when I say, you don't have to use it in a rigid cookie cutter way. And I sh- the best way to do it is to show them on films or in live how I kind of just blend that in. And it takes time. You have to learn your style. I, l- I use a lot of humor when I work with families because so- sometimes it's too structured. It blows people out. So you got to find your way with it. Yeah, correct. I always tell people, my students and on this podcast, I've said it a hundred times, our clients have enough problems. They shouldn't have to fit to our way of working, we should be flexibly structured enough to to meet where they are. So that kind of leads into my next question. So people would say, okay, you're, you're working on this behavioral level, and if you're getting change and they're doing the homework, that's great. And we'll only work on the cognitive level if we get stuck on the behavioral level or we see these thoughts coming up. Other people say, no, that's my lens. I'm going to start with the dysfunctional thoughts. That's how I look for constraints. That's how I look for problems between members of a system. You start behaviorally or do you start cognitively? It depends. It depends on the system. So uh, if I try to feel them out a little bit and see, sometimes uh, the cognitions are too intimidating for them. So we may have to start on a behavioral level or if I'm dealing with people who uh, have disabilities and uh, or have intellectual problems, the cognitive may be too much for them. So I'll start on a behavioral level or sometimes even an emotional level. We're not devoid of working with emotions. We just do it a little bit differently. 
I've always maintained the, the belief that there, the, no therapeutic approach is the be-all to end-all. Uh, there are a lot of wonderful therapeutic approaches that do good things and, and are successful, and it, you have to use the one that's best for you. I would, when I taught theories and uh, of counseling and psychotherapy, I taught each approach with the same zeal that I taught cognitive behavior therapy. So, because I believe that people have to, they have a right to be educated without a bias, and then they choose for themselves, which is the more effective for them, whether there's a lot of empirical evidence behind it or not. Uh, co-authored an article with Fred Piercy, who used to be the, for, he was the former editor of the Journal of Marriage and Family Therapy, and Sean Davis, about the divide that exists between this evidence-based and the, the, the approaches that are non-evidence-based. And I thought a lot of people were unfair to say that, well, some of the earlier th- approaches didn't have the rigid uh, research base and support, so, you know, you shouldn't use them. And I, I think that's very unfair. There's a lot of effectiveness uh, in those approaches, and you have to keep an open mind. So certainly blending them and using pieces of them, you can do that. It's the specific ingredients of a model, and we believe it is kind of common factors, practitioners, it's how the model's delivered. Like you said, your delivery, if anybody's ever watched you work, and it's part of what I had you on here, no one's on the show that is not a clinician first. I think this scientist practitioner, I always might not be popular in academic circles, but I always call myself a practitioner scientist because anything I've wanted to study or be interested about comes out of my direct exposure with Mm -hmm. individuals, couples, and families in the room. So talk about how you deliver a CBT within the context of a couple or a family. I I use uh, a lot of engagement with them. Uh, Like I said, there's certainly there's assigned readings uh, if they want to fortify their knowledge about it and a lot of examples. But when I, when I join a couple or join a family, I kind of become part of the family for a while or part of the couple for a while. And I will certainly listen to what what is the most uh, prominent when they come in which is a lot of emotional expression or or sometimes the lack of uh and i'll try to evoke some of that by you know sal mnuchin said at one time sometimes you really just need to push in therapy to get movement and uh, i'll do that at the right time but i really i i use the the person of the therapist as, as harry aponte says to, to kind of sell myself and engage with them so that they really feel I care about them and they're not just a number, you know? Like, I, I, I'm not against saying to a wife who's disappointed with her husband, you know, what do you want from your husband? What do you want from Pete or John? Uh, what What's he missing in uh, helping you fulfill your needs in the relationship? And, you know, I'll get that out a little bit and then it, I'll ask them about you know, their understanding of what's going on, what they're feeling, uh, what's going through your mind when you feel those things. And then that's a time for us to say, well, you know, we're all human and sometimes we can't avoid interjecting some bias in our thinking, which affects our behaviors and emotions. Do you think that there's any of that that exists uh, at any time? In a way that kind of doesn't put them on the spot, but elicits that to come out. And I'll do it right in front of the spouse. Uh, or if I'm working with family, I'll do it in front of the family so they can see that happen. And then we talk about, is there any room for modification? I, I did the uh, uh, live session with the Goldbergs, uh, which a lot of people love when I do uh, these presentations. And, you know, the, the, it's a Jewish family and a daughter, big surprise, finds a, an Italian boyfriend in, in college, starts dating him and wants to marry him. And, you know, the father just can't, he just can't accept this. He said, this is not what we do. And I said, he said, because it's the way we're raised and it's uh, it's our belief system. And I said, is there any room for any flexibility in there? Because he's telling me how flexible he is in other avenues and what a great father he is. And everybody's agreeing that he's a great father. So this is really getting to core beliefs and uh, his fear of losing the tradition, even though in, you know, with, with the Jewish uh, faith, they, they, if the mother's Jewish, the children will be Jewish. That was his biggest concern. And so we worked with that flexibility. And I, I rolled my chair over and allied with him a little bit to help him understand that I was there for him and trying to understand, but at the same time, try to help his family. So it's 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 interesting. you got to just be, I always say, you, you can't use the tact of a German jazz band where you go in there and you start crashing cymbals and everything. But it's a slow evolution of introducing these ideas 
in a very gentle, respectful way. And he came around and said, you know, yeah, I'm, I, I can see I'm distorted. I'm, I'm scared. That was what was underneath of his demonstrativeness with his saying, absolutely want, I, I won't come to this wedding. She's dead to me. And, uh, you know, of course, that got the ire of the wife and the family. But and, and just um, listening to that story, you, as you said, uh, CBT emotion might not be how the start of weary intervening, but any good intervention taps into that. So you tapped into the father and his fear, and you did it in a very gentle way and aligned with him. So let me just say real yeah, quick sure. uh, that I would, I all the time maintaining my objection, uh, my objectivity, never, never divulging to him that my daughter decided to become a Jew when she was discontented with uh, the, the Catholicism and converted and met her husband who's a rabbi and they have a wonderful Jewish family. I would never tell him that because then that would bias everything. Yeah, because it's not about me, it's about them. So, and he would say, well, you just don't understand. And I'm thinking, <laughs> boy, you have no idea, Elvis. <laughs> I understand a lot more than you think. but. I would never do that because that would contaminate the mix. So, yeah. So let's talk about these myths we've kind of debunked so far. First of all, that CBT uh, cannot be integrated into a systemic framework. Certainly it can. Second of all, that CBT doesn't evolve emotion because if you're doing it right, you're tapping on, I call it these, the, these golden threads of change. You're changing the doing, you're changing the thinking, and you're changing the feeling. And then this third myth we're kind of hit, hitting on that you know people think of CBT as this overly antiseptic from a manual where uh, it has to be uh, this many sessions in this way. So you also show it can be a flexible adaptation and you don't, like you said, have to hit people over the head with it. It's more of a, a gentle delivery on some It can be. Yes, it yeah. can be. I mean, there's still there are people who really believe in the structure, 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 and they use it that way, and that way it works for them. But I found with couples and families that you have to relax that a little bit. It, it's I found it's more successful when you blend it. I was thinking of your work. I show your video. You're working with this Latino, uh, it's a single mother, a divorced mother, and her three. She's got three different a teenager and a preteen and you do this great work because you're you're meeting them for the first time you're you're joining with them and you can see a good family therapy session and it makes sense with your background but you can also see as you're saying today the foundation is you know you can't do everything in 50 minutes but the foundation of setting getting pathways to exploring how people think and how able they are to modify some of those thoughts. When you think of your career, right? Because you, know, you appeal to, to many circles, um, but certainly you're known in our world of the AAMFT and in systemic therapy is, is integrating CBT to families. Do you call yourself a psychologist? Do you call yourself a family therapist? How do you label who you are, your own integrative identity? Uh, well, I'm trained as a psychologist, and my license is in psychology. Uh, that's a lot of what I do, but I, I specialize in couples and family therapy and a number of other things. I mean, I treat a lot of anxiety and depression, and uh, you know, I do a lot of forensic work as well. Uh, I so do. I, I want to talk about that. Yeah, that's that's different. Yeah. And I think that the grow, growing up with so much abuse in my life uh, really thickened my skin, so that's why I don't get rattled by cross-examining attorneys or, uh, you know, uh, prosecutors or whatever it, you, you kind of it kind of helps make you bulletproof <laughs> so yeah so if I, you I, have I, any automatic thoughts that you're not good enough you should not get into the expert witness business no, as you are no no, no. <laughs> um, i mean uh, you know I, I i've had a cross-examining attorney say uh, so you have a phd i said i said yes and he said did, did your parents get upset that you didn't become a real doctor and <laughs> crazy stuff like that <laughs> you know and, you, and you, you get punched for less than that in new jersey yeah <laughs> every pioneer that I've had on this podcast in the last three years, you can tell they love doing what they're doing. So you've been doing this for over four decades now, and you're still vital and clinically active. Let's talk about that work-life balance. I mean, it's the greatest profession, I think, in the world, because you can't age out of it. As long as you stay attuned and you're taking care of your relational self and your physical health, you can grow old in this profession. And with age, comes wisdom. Uh, so how much clinical work are you still doing and how are you balancing work and family? It's a question I always ask model developers as far as how they are productive and on all domains of their life. 
Sure. Well, and, and that's an excellent question. And, and I've written about, you know, the self-care of mental health professionals. And I, I you know, in, in one of my books, I also write, you know, that when you when you fly in an airplane, the in-flight instructions come on with a store to the stewardesses and they'll go through all the routine. And they, and they say that in, in the event of any cabin depressurization, oxygen masks will fall from the ceiling. If you are traveling with a child or an elderly person, put the mask on yourself first, which seems selfish. But if you lose consciousness, you can't help anybody else. So you got to take care of yourself. And I always tell people in this field, this is one of the stressful, most stressful fields uh, that exists next to first line responders or, you know, air traffic controllers. And so, uh, because it, what we do, we work with difficult families, couples and individuals, and it, it can be very draining. So if you work hard, you got to play hard. I, I haven't always been the best uh, of success with that because I was very passionate about my work and passionate about providing for my family. So it uh, it was always hard to balance it. I, I tried my best. I, I have three children and, and seven grandchildren who are also almost adults. And I often ask them, you know, was I there for you enough and did I do enough for you? And, they, and they're not being kind. They're saying, yeah, Dad, you did. You know, you worked a lot, but we appreciate what you did. Of course, my balance didn't always work out so well i somewhere along the line i decided i was going to try cooking give my wife a break and again you, you didn't learn it from your mother we we no, figured that no, out no but i didn't get my i also was passed up on the gene load uh genetic load from my grandmother and i just it, it was terrible and in fact my kids got to the point where they they begged me to stop and even offered to get back their allowance if i would stop cooking um, my, my oldest daughter was a teenager at that time. You know, teenagers have no compunction about just telling it like it is. I, one time I told her to take out the garbage. She said, you cooked it, you take it out. I said, so I think I better stop. I, I tried. But I did different things, different hobbies. Uh, we got into rock climbing and uh, artifact, collecting artifacts. And I, I, whenever I had lectures in foreign countries, I took them with us and, you know, tried to show them the world. And we do a lot of stuff as a family. That balance is very important, but it's not easy to strike because, you know, you want to start to developing a thriving practice. you got to put the time in. And, you know, it means being there sometimes and you miss some baseball games and you miss some dance recitals, and but you try to minimize that. Uh, it, it's very difficult, but you got to remind yourself. And my wife was a great reminder of, hey, listen, you know, you're, you're slipping come back to the fall here and and she was great i mean she's been my wonderful partner and and best friend for 44 years and uh yeah you've that been, was been really in a long-term marriage which is is awesome and you have to have people that understand why you do what you do and you're still very very clinically active what do you still when i talk to you know i've been doing this for 20 years you've been doing this for twice over twice as long as that you, you got to keep running talk that about in, the, don't you yeah <laughs> Yeah. No, I mean, again, it comes with wisdom. And I, I always, when, when somebody is still as vital th that long after they started and still is doing the work, those are the people I like talking to because there's a common factor in that there's a therapist factor of, of passion and still learning from their clients. Once you figured you have it all figured out, it's time to stop doing this work because I always learn from the people I work with. What do you still love about doing the work? Well, I, I, I love people. I love working with people and helping them make changes for themselves. Uh, I hear different stories all the time. Uh, it helps me grow in my own family and, and marriage. I've learned to really whittle that down and be more reasonable. Uh, my wife often tells me that my brain's writing checks my body can't cash. And come on, you're, you know, you're approaching 70. And, and she's right. You have to be more reasonable. I've, I've really, I've been to 90 countries. You know, that's enough. So we really started to cut back some of that and uh, not travel as much. But we go where we like to go and, and what, what seems interesting. And my, my wife and I also developed a scholarship for needy students and folks in the community. About 35 years ago, we decided to take our royalties and uh, on lectures and books and put them into a scholarship fund. And we've given away tens and thousands of dollars to help needy students, uh, uh, we went to uh, the ex-Yugoslavia to train. It's like uh, mental health therapists had to deal with the refugee problem after the war. We've been to Israel to help family therapists uh, with uh, the the uh, 22,000 terrorist attacks they had. Uh, you know that's a good feeling. So we do some of that stuff that it's kind of a 
helps us give back to the community and use what we've earned and grow from it. So we try to maintain that balance. And so I, I, I'm doing it, but within reason. And you've got to see the world uh, by doing what you love, bringing family therapy to these uh, remote places. What yeah. do you think in all this time, you think the biggest changes to the profession of MFT or systemic therapy from when you started to now? I, I'm going to give you a positive and negative because I, I like balance. The positive is we have really evolved. I think there are more people in our society throughout the world that go to couples and family therapists than they've ever been. Uh, when I first started, uh, they, they weren't recognized by insurance. They weren't recognized as mental health uh, professionals. It was kind of a looked at as a, a non-therapeutic uh, approach. So that's grown tremendously thanks to organizations like AAMFT and others. There's also more approaches than ever to choose from. And a lot of great ones. I think that, uh, you know, young students today uh, have a, 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 a lot of, a, a vast array of approaches and, and techniques to use that are very effective. And that's wonderful. I think that uh, marriage and family therapists are <clears throat> more accepted and uh, considered uh, vital uh, in uh, the field of mental health. And I think that it's also caused more people to take a look at their own lives and get themselves into therapy. I, I spent years in my own therapy. Uh, I think it's kind of a hypocritical to, to go into this field without cleaning out your own closets and dealing with your own stuff uh, or you're projected all over the place. And I'm so glad you mentioned that because it, it's such a vital, not only when you're young and you're training, you know, we tell our students to, how important it is to get that experience Experience on the other side of the couch, if you will, uh, while you're in training, but throughout your career, having a resource like that, like, again, there's no stigma, just like it's a parallel process. You, you don't want your clients to think uh, there's a stigma, but coming in and getting help. So, I mean, same reason I see my guy, you see your guys. So I think having outlets like that is essential if you're going to not burn out, like we said, and stay vital all these years. Right. Sure. And, and, and uh, I went through psychodynamic therapy for a long time. Uh, and I a world I away from high. CBT, yeah, but but a lot of a lot of parallels, and I learned I have great respect for psychodynamic, as well as you know uh, Rogerian approaches and reality oriented approaches, and um, you know there, there's a lot of different roads to lo Rome, and so it, it's helped me expand a lot of my thinking, and uh, I think you got to you got to deal with your own issues because it it's it'll burp up in your face during the course of your work with, with couples and families. And So we're talking uh, about the those are the changes you saw that were good, and you said you mm -hmm. want to balance it out. What are the things that are maybe not so good professionally uh, as we, um, where we are as a field since, since you started? I don't like the competitiveness that I see among theories. I, I think that every theory has something good to offer, and I think that any bias – is an unhealthy and I have seen presenters who put down other approaches to bolster their own uh, and I always tell my students and audiences beware of anybody that does that I, I never speak critically of any approach when I am asked about that I talk about the good the good things I think I talk about some of the weaknesses but in a balanced way it, it was about 20 years ago I was at this presentation out in California with Michael White uh, God rest his soul. And uh, he was great. I saw a couple of my colleagues there from New York and Philadelphia. They're, they're walking around and they're speaking with an Australian brogue. And I said, what, what happened to your voice? And they said, what? I said, you're, you're speaking with an Australian accent. And they said, oh, well, we're getting into it. You know, we're trying to be like Michael White. I said, well, <laughs> you're from Brooklyn. What are you doing? I, you know, it, it's well, you don't have to do that to be effective in the, in the approach. And I think a lot of people kind of lose themselves and they think they have to be like Sal Mnuchin or, or like uh, Michael White or someone else. And you've got to be your own therapist and, and use that as it adapts to your style and your, your own personal uh, sense of a therapist. And so I, I think that a lot of students, they, 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 they lose themselves and they think they've got to be too much like that. And I try to teach my supervisees how to be their own therapist and use it and adapt it 
in their own style. Exactly. You and also another thing I tell people is if you only know one thing, then you can't see the commonalities and the universalities that exist between different models and which makes good therapies good therapies and good therapists good therapists. So we've gotten to hear a little bit about your story and everything. Tell us something else. Obviously you won many awards. You have the Career Achievement Award from AMFT about seven years ago. Uh, hundreds of articles published. You're still very active. But tell us something that cannot about you. You want our listeners to know that can't be captured in a book or a journal article or a standard interview about CBT. I, I'm a down the earth guy. I believe in being, you know, just an, an ordinary person. I I always tell people to please address me by Frank. Uh, I'm more comfortable with that. And and tell me when you think I'm wrong. I'm very open to feedback. Obviously, I grew up, you know, taking crap from people all my life. So I'm, you know, I learned to be open minded and be introspective. And so I I try to balance that out. One of the things I don't write about either is the notion of ownership. I don't think we own anything, you know, which is why I don't refer to this as a, you know, a detilio approach or a detilio technique. I, I, it's just within that realm of cognitive behavioral or family therapy. And I think that when we begin to become too attached to it, that's not a good thing either. Try to keep my balance all the time and ask myself, am I going out too much on the limb or am I being fair? Am I being balanced? Uh, those things I don't certainly write about. Some, somewhat, but not to that degree. And I also believe that what's happened in our lives has happened for a reason. I've been deathly sick twice. I, I believe that that happened for a reason. It kind of woke me up. Uh, it's a, it, sometimes it's a way of you reshuffling the deck and thinking about your life and what you're doing. And you use those. I use those in a subtle way in my work with people. Uh, to be more compassionate, to be more understanding with them. Uh, I hope that makes sense. I'm not just no, no it, it does. And I'm, I'm, I find myself being curious because I know you a little bit, but not well enough to know that this idea of we were talking about earlier, self care and life's natural consequences force you to readjust and recalibrate and find this balance. And I think that's important to know. Even therapists, we have to practice what we preach for our clients in, in order to to make that work. You mentioned earlier about the Jewish and, and Catholic dynamic, not kind of mentioning your own experience as to mess up the alliance with the client. But as far as your own, when you're working with a highly productive client that doesn't have much self-care or balance, do you share your own story in that regards? Or is it more modeling it by action versus Uh, telling your story? uh, I share it kind of a a generic way about, uh, I'll say some people, uh, you know, like I'll get this with couples, they'll say, well, you must have a perfect marriage. And I say, well, I don't think anybody has a perfect marriage. Everybody has problems. And because, I, if, again, if it becomes too much about me, it contaminates it. But not that I'm uh, against sharing that, but again, it's what's in the best interest of the clients. For example, you know, I, I was working with somebody with MS and they said, you know, you don't you don't know what it's like. And I, <laughs> I'm going to say, yeah, oh, yeah, I do. I was paralyzed. Uh, you know, I was paralyzed. I know what it's like, but I'm not going to say that. I said, well, you tell me what it's like. Help me understand what it's like. Because if I tell him, well, I was paralyzed and I was almost put on a ventilator and, you know, at least you're still walking, you know, that's not going to help them. But by saying kind of, you tell me what, I want to know what that's like for you. It works better than when you do that because then you neutralize it too much and it's, oh, well, your story is much worse than mine. I guess I shouldn't feel so bad. Well, that's not going to help him. So I, I'm careful with that. I appreciate you sharing that. Now, interviewing these model developers, like I said, one of the common factors is they are still as engaged and as passionate about their work at this stage of their career as they were in the beginning. Uh, so what what do you want to do in this next stage of your career? And then the uh, tough question, but I always ask it, is what do you want your professional legacy to be? Well, my, one of my goals is to take a nap in the middle of the afternoon. I can't wait to start doing that. <laughs> Uh, yeah, really, just to break up. Uh, you know, the Italians have a saying, uh, il dolce fa niente, which is the sweetness of doing nothing. Sometimes you just need to veg out and do nothing and stop, you know, just being productive and doing this. But it just take time and get into the moment and relax. And you don't have to be productive. You can just kind of vegetate a little bit. I like that. My legacy, I don't want a legacy. I don't want people to remember me. I want them to remember the techniques and the approaches and forget my name's attached to it because it's not about me. It's about what's in the approach and what they can utilize. 
if they want to read about it, that's fine. I certainly were cited in there, but I don't want that focus to be on that. I would rather them think about what the more important aspect is that the techniques and not associate with me. That's just a personal. No, that, that's wonderful. We'll, we'll end where we started. We talked about your parents and what it was like and, and to feel singled out because of your Italian-American roots. Your own children, do they have a sense of what you've kind of done? And you, you mentioned uh, you know, your three children and seven grandchildren. What do they think about what their father has accomplished? <laughs> well, they, you know, one time my, my wife had to go somewhere and I had to see a family on, on a Saturday morning. And my, my youngest son was seven at the time. He's almost 40 now. She said, you're going to have to take him to the office because I can't watch. I said, all right. So I, I'll put him in a playroom and I'll see this family. He was just a little guy. And uh, I had this, you know, really cha- chaotic, dysfunctional family. <laughs> Although all families are dysfunctional in some way. But these be- they were screaming and yelling and shouting. Afterwards, uh, I said, all right, Mikey, you ready to go? He says, Dad, what was going on in there? And I said, well, you know, Dad was doing his work. And he said, well... Is this what you do, Dad? You, you sit in with these families when they're yelling and screaming, and well, what, what do you, you know? Yeah, I, that's why. I said, why do you do that? <laughs> what, what do you tell a seven-year-old? I said, well, Mikey, Daddy does this so you know he can buy you toys. And he was silent for a minute, and he looked at me. He says, Dad, I don't need toys that bad. <laughs> oh my God! It must have really been bad. They think, you know, oh, boy, I can't do that. I wouldn't do that. What do you do that for? They, they get it. They've seen uh, what I've done. And I said, don't look at the accolades and the other stuff, but look at, you know, when people would come up to me in, in, in public when I was with my family and they say, you know, I just want to thank you. I saw you 10 years ago, 20 years ago, or whatever. And uh, you really helped us change. And I really appreciate it. That's where they got it. They say, you know, that's, you really made, did something meaningful. And I thought, look, if I've changed one person's life or one family's life, that's good enough for me. Um, so that's, uh, they, they kind of get it. They, they still say that they wouldn't want to do this because it's, it's, uh, kind of the stress that they, although my, my son's a police detective and he still says it's my job still easier than what you have. Well, I can't thank you enough for the time. You are a, pardon the pun, a good fellow. You are a, uh, a, a good guy. And I think our, our listeners will learn a lot. The man behind the approach and, I can't thank you enough for your time, Frank. Well, it's my pleasure, and I appreciate you doing this series. I think it's a wonderful series, and I wish you a lot of good luck with it. Eli, back with you, wrapping up another successful installment of the AAMFT podcast. I learned a lot by listening to Frank. He's a guy you can imagine. It'd be fun to sit down, have an adult beverage with, if that's your thing, or just share a meal and have a good conversation. A true mensch. Thanks, Frank. Here at the AAMFT podcast, we strive to bring you... The greatest in thought leaders put Frank in that category with topical issues affecting the press practice of systemic therapy and what's going on in the AMFT. As always, I enjoy and rely on the feedback, not just in the therapy room, in the podcast world too. That's a lot of how I find my guests and especially content areas for the show. Get hold of me at info at elikaram.com. That's E-I-L-I-K-A-R-A-M dot com. You can join the conversation on Twitter. AMFT's handle is at the AAMFT. I'm at Dr. Eli Live. Remember, follow us wherever you get your favorite podcast. I'm partial to Apple Podcasts, but you can find us on Google, Stitcher, Spotify. I really appreciate the feedback. Please like, subscribe, leave a review, help us rise through the ranks of the Mental Health Podcast. Until next time, my friends, stay systemic.